of the Mission of St. Marie de Sioux, 1674, by Claude de Blon, read by Frank Blissett. We are sufficiently informed by the preceding relations as to what mission this is, and how general is the resort to it of the nations, who come in summertime to take the whitefish, which abound in the rapids of the Sioux, where Lake Superior discharges its waters. It is this great concourse of peoples that has compelled us to establish ourselves in this place, that we may the more conveniently instruct them, and to build thereat a second chapel, yet more beautiful than the first, which was burned down in 1671. Little was wanting that this one also had been consumed by a second fire, much worse by far than the first, inasmuch as it resulted from one of the most tragic occurrences that had ever been witnessed in this country. This accident had most deplorable results, for it was preceded by an act of treachery that broke up a peace, almost concluded, which was about to open the door of the gospel to the great nation of the Naduisi, and, besides, it spread terror throughout the country by the massacre of more than 230 persons, and by the fear of a bloody war, which needs must follow so dire a tragedy. It occurred in the following manner, in the spring of the year 1674. The Ned Wessey, a nation exceedingly numerous and warlike, were the common enemies of all of the savages included under the name of Ottawak, or Upper Algonquins. They even pushed forward their arms vigorously toward the north, and, making war with the Kilistinons who dwelt there, rendered themselves everywhere terrible by their daring, their numbers, and their skill in battle, in which they use, among other weapons, knives of stone. Of these they always carry two, one attached to the girdle, the other suspended by the hair. However, a band of warriors from St. Marie de Sioux, having surprised them in their own country and taken eighty of them prisoners, compelled them to sue for peace. For this purpose they sent to the Sioux ten of the most daring among them to negotiate it. They were received with joy as soon as the object of their coming was understood. It was the Callistanons alone who had lately arrived, save some others named Mississauquas, who not only expressed their dissatisfaction in the matter, but resolved, moreover, to prevent the peace from being concluded. They even determined to massacre the ten ambassadors a proceeding which made it necessary that the latter, in order to ensure their safety, should be placed in the French house, which had been erected for the convenience of the missionaries. Father Gabriel Druillet took advantage of that opportunity to instruct them in our mysteries. They listened with so much docility that, when the instruction was over, they all knelt down, and, joining their hands, invoked Jesus, the Lord of life, of whom we had just been speaking to them. Meanwhile the savages assembled at the French house, part of them to conclude the peace with the Nadwesi, others to obstruct its conclusion. Everything imaginable was done to prevent those who went in from carrying arms. But as the crowd was very great, 
five or six slipped in without having their knives taken from them. It was one of these latter, a Callistanon by nation, who began all of the disturbance that ensued. Approaching a Nadwesi, knife in hand, he said to him, Thou art afraid, threatening at the same time to strike him. The Nadwesi, undismayed, replied to him in a haughty tone and with a confident air, If thou thinkest that I tremble, strike straight at the heart. Then, feeling himself struck, he cried out to those of his nation, They are killing us, my brothers. At these words the men stirred up to vengeance, and, moreover, very powerful and of commanding stature, arose and struck with their knives at all the assembled savages, without making any distinction between Callistanons and Soutiers, believing that they had all equally conspired in the design to assassinate them. It was not very difficult for them to accomplish a great carnage in a short time, when we consider that they found the multitude unarmed and expecting anything but an attack of that kind. The Kilistanon who had begun the quarrel was among the first to be stabbed, and he, with several others, fell dead on the spot. Afterward, the Nadwesi posted themselves at the door of the house to guard it and to stab those who would have taken to flight, but seeing that many had already escaped and gone in search of arm, they closed the door against these, resolved to defend themselves to the last breath. In fact, they stationed themselves at the windows, and as by chance they had found some guns with powder and ball, they used these to disperse their enemies, whose desire it was to burn them by setting fire to the place where they were confined. They killed in this way some of those who ventured too close, but in spite of their efforts some others came close to the house. These men, having piled up against it some straw and some birch-bark canoes, set fire to them, which at once placed them in danger of being consumed in the flames. It was this that drove them to give a last proof of their courage. All ten sallied forth, their arms in their hands, and with an incredible quickness threw themselves into a cabin made of stakes, which was hard by. In this they defended themselves, and ceased not to slay while powder and ball lasted them. When at last these failed them, they were laid low by the great number of savages who were firing upon them, and they, with two women who had accompanied them, were all slain on the spot. A third woman was spared, because they perceived that she was only their slave, and was an Algonquin by nation. All the time while this tumult and massacre were going on, the fire which the savages had kindled at the missionary's house was steadily increasing, and, in spite of all that could be done, it soon consumed the whole edifice, which was only wooden, and placed the new chapel not far away in great jeopardy of being also burned. Our people did so well, however, that they saved it. It was a horrible spectacle to see so many dead, and so much blood shed in so small a space, and horrible to hear the cries of those who warmed to the battle, and the groans of the wounded amid the tumult of an exasperated rabble that scarcely knew what it did. Our savages bewailed forty of their number, dead or wounded, 
among whom were some of the leading and most notable men, while the missionaries on their side had great cause for affliction in losing so soon the hope of going to preach the gospel to the Nadwesi, which the peace about to be concluded with them had inspired. In addition, they saw themselves abandoned by the savages of the country who, in the fear that the Nadwesi, seeing the delay of their people, would suspect what had happened to them and be prompted to take vengeance for their deaths, all withdrew and left them exposed to the fury of the enemy. Thus, besides the danger of being massacred in which they are every day, not only at the Sioux, but in every other place as well where they set up their mission, the progress which the gospel was beginning to make by their means has been seriously arrested for some time. God has not failed to derive his glory from these misfortunes and to make use of them, both for procuring the salvation of some souls and in making manifest the extraordinary effects of his almighty power. For several of those who had been dangerously wounded solicited baptism, and, having received it, were healed of their wounds. That was Of the Mission of St. Marie de Sioux, 1674, by Claude de Blon, read by Frank Blissett.